it said that Jesus loves you and has a plan for your life. Is this true? Can the same be said for your mother? Yeah, she loves you and has a plan. What about your dad? What about your pastor? Poor Clint. He loves you. He really does. But he has a plan for your life. Most of the time that plan's the same. Not always. Today's text, which my my pastor Clint gave me to preach, is from the you know, Mark 10. And what ended up happening was because he was, you know, Easter comes, he had to skip a few verses as he was preaching through Mark, and he thought, we'll fill those in. So the last couple of weeks he talked about things like divorce and remarriage and other really important things, but he saved me really important things that I get to preach. And we'll finish off Mark together. Because Mark is kind of like the first gospel that was written by John Mark. My name's John Mark, so I like this book. But anyways, Matthew picks up a lot of what Mark says, and almost identical, but because he was the guy who was there live, instead of having like 12 chapters, he does like 26 or whatever it is, or 14 or 28, I can't remember. But he fills in all these gaps. And sometimes it's word for word what Mark says. And sometimes there's a little bit added. So what I wanted to do today, even though I'm preaching from Mark 10, we're going to read it from Matthew 20 because it's got a couple little very important details added. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and she knelt down and asked a favor of him. What is it that you want, he asked. And she said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your kingdom. Wow. Is that what your mom would want for you? I hope so. What a godly mother that would want not... Like, I mean, all of our mothers wants us to be successful, but really, she didn't ask for riches. She didn't ask for health. She didn't ask that they would be happy. She wanted them to be great in God's kingdom. That's a pretty good mom. But Jesus' response is very important here. And you notice he does not rebuke her. And he does not rebuke the boys either. Because obviously they're in on this. They're with her. In fact, Mark leaves out the fact the mother is there when he writes it down. It's just about, this is about John and James wanting to be great in God's kingdom. And Jesus does not say, You're bad for wanting this. In fact, it seems to me that sometimes in God's kingdom, we kind of look down on ambition. This isn't what the text is saying. At no point does he rebuke them for wanting to be great in his kingdom. In fact, if you go the chapter before in Matthew... He finishes telling them things like, because he's talking about the last will be first and the first will be last. But he says to the disciples, you know, when I come and sit on my throne in heaven, there's going to be 12 thrones for the apostles that are faithful to me. And they will judge the 12 tribes of Israel. He's already told them they have a great thing coming. He's already just finished telling them as well that whatever you ask in my name, I will give you. But both in Mark and in Matthew, the three verses before this are saying, I am going to Jerusalem 
this is the time I am going to be turned over to the chief priests and, the, and they will kill me. And then in three days I'll rise up again. So my kingdom is coming this weekend. You ever have that idea that if, if I'm going to ask for something, I have a very limited amount of time to ask? We don't know it, but all of us are living on limited borrowed time. And now is the time to draw close to God. Now is the time to set things up for eternity. I thought about doing this, but you don't know me well enough and you think I'm crazy, but I am, so it's all right. Um, I thought about getting one of the kids to get a string. And as we were talking, he would go, and wind that string around the pews. And I'd stop him after about five minutes, and I'd take a little black marker, and I'd mark one little mark on, one of the, on the string, and then I'd let him kill with the kite string again. And at the, after he ran out of string, I'd say, you know what? In reality, if this is the timeline, that string never ends. But our time on earth is that little black dot. And sometimes we're so focused on getting the most out of that one little black dot that we forget about the fact that we are going to be living forever and ever and ever. And our emphasis should be on the things of God because that's what's setting up eternity. It's kind of a different kind of thought that we should be focused on those things. And that Jesus does not rebuke James and John or his mother because they're worried about what's going to happen forever, not about what's happening right now. So I thought that it was just very important that we mention that if we focus on now, which is normally what our parents are about, get a good education, get a good job, Save money, you know. Even if they're doing it right, it's like 10% goes in this little area that goes to God, and 10% goes into savings, and 10% goes in. And they teach you good, godly things. But they forget to tell you about the most important. Anyways, I just, it's kind of a neat area in here when you're to preach on this. There's a, I was telling my son, one of the worst things I can do, because this is such a vague topic, everything's right there in front of you, is to take, take this text and go somewhere where I want to go rather than where God wants it to go. So just to get into it, we started with that, okay? The second thing that this text is really talking about, let's read more of it. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? And Mark adds, or the baptism I'm about to be baptized in. Did you know that when Jesus talks about the cup he's going to drink or the baptism he's going to be, this is terms and illustrations that he uses regularly to signify his death. The cup of death. The baptism where I am going to lay down my life. Three days later, I will come back again, raised new, changed, that I'm willing to set down what I have for God's purposes so that, like, I don't know how many times when he's talking about baptism or about the cup, he talks about, I didn't come to do my will. I only came to do the will of my Father. And so when he says, are you willing to take and drink that cup, and they say, we are. It's not that they don't understand. He said, I'm going there. They're going to kill me. And he says, are you willing to do that too? And they are. Later, you'll read in the other Gospels too, where they say, 
well, we will lay, let's go and Andrew says to Peter and the rest, let's go as well, they'll kill us as well. They are willing to. It's kind of a, they really are putting the things of God first. We can, they answered. And Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from the cup, but to sit on my right or left is not mine to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. Would you be shocked if James or John is sitting on Jesus' left or right side? He's big, isn't he? I don't know. But more importantly, it doesn't matter. When we talk about what faith is, I, I like how Eugene Peterson, who did the, the paraphrase, the message, he says, what is faith? He says, faith is believing that God is God. That he is powerful enough to keep his word and that he loves you. You see, if you had an all powerful being that had only his own agenda. It would be pretty hard to worship him the way we worship Christ. Faith is also believing not only that he can, but that he will keep his word. And when he says that he came to give us life and life to the fullest, when he said that this world is not all there is, when he turned to even the thief on the cross beside him, he said, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. When I say God loves you and has a plan for your life, if you don't believe that he's a loving God, that's a scary thought. But we serve an all-loving God. I love the verse that says, perfect love casts out all fear. When you have a situation, I'm sure you've all witnessed this when you go shopping or you're at Tim Hortons and there's these kids. And the older kid is picking on the little kid. You ever seen this? And if the parent ignores it going on, what happens? That kid gets even. He does something. It could be the younger one picking on the older one. It doesn't really matter. But if one of those children is abusing the other child, bad things are going to happen. But if the parent looks And the kid who's doing the picking on knows that there's going to be a consequence. The other child is quite safe in everything that's happening. This is kind of how it is as being a Christian. There's times in this world where things don't make sense. Good people get cancer. Christians die. I was reading my friend's blog this last week. He's uh, from Winnipeg, and he's somebody I've known since, since before, I don't know, like 30-some years. And we're not close friends, but he's, he's dying of cancer, and he's writing about when his daughter was kidnapped and raped and killed. And he's writing about stuff that I remember and details I didn't remember. And he's coming to peace with the idea that God knew what he was doing anyways. 
And that literally that story has been able to touch people's hearts for decades now. And out of the memorial of that, they built a beautiful swimming pool at a church camp, Camp Arness, and, and how they've been able to tell that story and give hope to people that God's still going to take care of it. It's awful, isn't it? But he believes with all of his heart that Jesus loves him and loved Candace and their other kids. And he had a plan and he's going to make it good for the rest of eternity on that string. But that little piece that happened right there was awful. But compared to this, it's going to be okay. If we don't believe that, Life is really going to be hard because those things happen to everybody. Everybody has a flat tire. Everybody has somebody backstab them and get the promotion when you get... Everybody has the company they work for go broke or close. Everybody has their investments in Bitcoin or whatever. Everybody has that stuff happen. And if you believe that God's got a plan for you, and he's not going to allow you to be tempted beyond that which you can bear, and that he loves you enough to die for you, then it's okay. Because he's going to make it right. Like he says, I am making all things new. It's a... If you don't believe that, you will have to retaliate. You have to fight back. You have to self-promote. You have to get... Because if you don't believe God's doing it, who else is looking out for number one? You know, and, and that's the way the world works. The world says, if it's going to be, it's up to me. The world says, fool me once, Shame on me. Shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Jesus says, turn the other cheek. I got this under control. Revenge is mine, says the Lord. He's going to take care of you. So, back to our text. I'm sorry I started off on this rant. But it's very important that we get the idea that they understood that. Brings us to our next little bit. How many people think that knowing other people's business is a good thing? Does it ever work out good? How about comparing? When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and he said, now here's where the rebuke happens. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Indeed, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Here's a thought for you. We seem surprised if it costs us something to help somebody else. We seem to think, like, if you do good things, it's like putting something in the bank, and then good things come back to us. We, we say we believe in karma. It's like you have a bank account. I do enough good things. Less bad things, I have a positive, and things are going to work out. I've got news for you. Think about yourself. I don't 
want any show of hands, nobody looking at each other. Think about the worst thing you've ever done. Is there anything you could do that would be good enough to make up for that? Think of the worst thing you've done this month. The worst thought. What could you do that makes up the karma for that? See, our God is not fair. Life is not fair. But we have a God who says, the price of that thought, the price of that action, the price of the worst thing I've ever done was put on Christ. And when he gave his life as a ransom for you, he exchanged that evil and put his righteousness on us. And what this real text is all about saying is, if you want to do what Jesus did, if you want to wear that little WWJD bracelet we used to have, what would Jesus do? He laid down his wants, his life, everything he had. He set aside his rights in heaven for you. And that's what being a Christ follower is. It's taking and putting God first, his kingdom first, and those people he puts in our life ahead of our own comforts, desires, even our needs, because we know that our parent in heaven is going to intervene and take care of us, and we don't have to be our own defender. God is the God of eternity, of that string that never ends, of the... This world will continue to tell you over and over again that you've got to take care of yourself. You only get what you take. God's kingdom is about laying down your life and letting him do it. Let's be practical about some of this stuff. There's going to be times where, if you're younger, God's word says things like, wait till you're married to sleep with somebody. Don't lie. Don't steal. Don't cheat. This world will say two consenting adults. Two consenting adults. How's that? Nobody else is getting hurt. What's the difference? God's word says, I love you. I have a plan for your life. Don't go there. Because your temple, your body is my temple. I live there. Don't unite me with, wait, do it right, and I will take care of things. The promotion at work, when things go wrong at work and I blame others instead of taking, you know, I could go on and on. Like, I mean, it could be right up to us people that are getting closer to the end of life than the beginning of life, and some of us have a bit of money not me, but maybe some of you do. And it comes tax time. Be honest. Because that honors God, and it's trusting him to take care of things, not me. Let's just do one thing, okay? Let's, like John and James, acknowledge that we can't do this we have to ask Christ a favor. But let's ask the right favor. 
Let's bow our heads and we'll close our eyes and we'll ask God for a favor. Lord, I pray that you increase our faith. That you increase our our understanding of your love for us. Lord, I pray that you help us to look at eternity rather than temporal things. Lord, I pray that you help me to live in the the righteousness you've given me. In Jesus' name, amen. I have one more point I want to make before the musicians come back, or they can even come back now as we make it. When I say God loves you and has a plan for your life, and I listed all these others, God has an enemy, and he is our enemy, and he has a plan for your life, and he does not love you. And his plan is to ruin your relationship between God and you. And that doesn't only have to do with I did something bad. We said earlier that perfect love drives out all fear. As Christians, as God followers, as people that have been given Christ's righteousness, sometimes we still live in that fear. He wants us to live in shame. Righteousness, it's gone. We don't serve that anymore. Guilt, we don't, shouldn't have guilt. We should have Christ's righteousness. I want to pray that when we find this truth, that we no longer have fear, guilt, or shame. Because those are things that the enemy has a plan for your life. And we can get rid of those only one way. That's by accepting Christ's ransom for our lives. Heavenly Father, I pray not just for heaven. And Lord, I do pray that each person here has a saving knowledge of you and surrenders to you and trust you for eternity. But Lord, I pray for this side of the grass too, that you take away all of our fear, that we cast it on you. You take away all of our shame and all of our guilt because you've already paid the price when you paid that ransom for our stuff. In Christ's name, amen.